proofread exhibitions, I would like to thank you all for joining the session on the fifth day of India Warehousing Show, a digital week. I hope you have taken many takeaways from the last sessions in the last four days. In, and in today's session also, we are going to talk about another interesting topic, and we have a great leader from the industry today with us. I would like to thank you all, speakers, for taking out time to share their valuable insights today. Before we start the session, we have a white paper launch on urban logistics by JLL. And for that, I would like Mr. Sujesh Bera, Director, Industrial and Logistics, JLL. Sujesh, over to you. Thanks, Rima, and thank you, everyone. It's giving me immense, immense pleasure to have, be in front of this feminine panel. And definitely, we'll be looking forward to share some of the insights on the urban logistics. I'll share my screen and we'll definitely work on this or look around this in a very quick manner. So if you typically look at the urban logistics space, the most important part of the urban logistics space is the first mile and the last mile. First mile is from the manufacturer to the warehouse, the last mile from the warehouse to the consumer. And there we found that this is the most critical and maybe or should be the most managed step of a product's journey. When you look at the globally, when you look at the global scenario, we found out that the overall study that we have done on a global basis with the overall online retail segment, almost 20% of the consumers of the online retailer, they're looking for less than few hours delivery. And almost 46% of the customers are looking for a next day delivery, which is almost 60 to 70% of the total customer pie in this segment. Also, when you look at the urban freight, in 2020, almost 45 to 50% of the urban freight or the urban logistics that has been traveled is actually in terms of the transportation cost that has been taken for the last mile delivery. And this is one of the most important parameters these days in terms of the urban logistics or the last mile delivery is the most costliest mile. When you look at the urban logistics or the last mile delivery and its importance in India, the e-commerce growth, 2018, it was 50 billion. And in the next 10 years, by 2017, we are expected to see a 4x quantum jump. The e-commerce penetration, lifestyle upgrades, convenience, accessibility, and related factors, and as well as the urbanization, this is going to be the catalyst for this growth. And this is where the last mile delivery is going to be the next gen of the delivery segment. And what, why this urban logistics or the last mile delivery is most important? So this helps the lower fulfillment cost. This is one of the most important aspects in terms of customer satisfaction for the clients. This is also helps in increasing the profit by minimizing the logistics cost. And what we have looked at is different spaces, different locations and different players in different segments are actually looking for this urban logistics space. We have sort centers where the e-commerce and the non-grocery segments are actually taking place. We have dark stores, where the e-commerce, grocery, and non-grocery segments are taking space. We have micro fulfillment centers. All the retail giants, they are actually going through this. There are B2B and B2C e-commerce who are actually taking up and moving into the spaces. We have the hybrid retail stores, omnichannel clients. Now, this is one of the phenomenon where not only India, globally, we are seeing this omnichannel players are actually taking up spaces. They also need this immediate delivery or the next day delivery. And this is going to be one of the biggest game changers. Another important factor that we have found is a cloud kitchen. E-commerce cloud kitchens are also looking for this sort of urban logistics and uh, spaces that is going to help in terms of the last mile delivery segment. So we actually have down uh, deeper on this. We try to understand how this sort of urban logistics space are actually going to save the cost. So almost 10 to 30% of logistics costs are actually going to be saved by the dark stores. Our supply chain team has run a quick uh, hypothetical model on this and we have found out this is an increasing and interesting factor. And then we looked at what is the demand for this. And interestingly, from now till the end of 2022, almost 7 million square feet of demand is in the market. 74% of that in the tier one cities and 26% of that is actually in the tier two cities. Now a 5 million square feet, which is 74% of the uh, demand in the tier one cities is no joke. This is a large demand that is what we are going to see in the next one, one and a half year. And that is going to be changing the space of this urban logistics or the in-city spaces that we are seeing over the years. And how JLL can help in this urban logistics space. So when we have seen this 7 million square feet of demand, we are 
we are always there we already have concluded more than 15 transactions in this both grocery and non grocery formats only in the first half of 2021 so on the transaction advisory side we are always there we also have a supply chain and logistics solutions team who works on the strategy tactical aspects as well as the operational aspects where we are going to help the end customers or the potential users of this in terms of different types of services to help them uh, get the solutions so this is how uh, we i think this is one of the space that we are looking forward next one year definitely there we are going to see a lot of lot of movement and definitely lot of things going to be come up and with this i think uh, we are launching this white paper do read this and do keep us give us your feedback and do correct if you have any further queries on this and thanking you all and rima over to you from here thank you okay thank you uh, sujesh now let's move on to our panel discussion and let me introduce the topic of today's webinar warehousing through the lens of atmanirbhar bharat building warehousing competitiveness key trends shaping the new world of warehousing and i'm pleased to introduce the moderator of our session himendra dhongade head transactions logistic and industrial jll himendra has extensive experience of over 17 plus years in real estate he looks after the core industrial brokerage business that is leasing and land transaction for jll india recorded version of webinar will be available on the platform now without a further talk here i would like to return the time over to our moderator himendra over to you thank you rima thank you so much before we begin the session i think we have a very esteemed panel on this program let me introduce the panel to you guys uh, we have abhijit malkani ceo esr india along with him is prakrut mehta head leasing esr india we also have sharad guil md fund and asset management industries capital we have anshun singhal managing director westpan logistics power we have rk narayan chief operating officer all cargo logistics power then we have from the end end user perspective we have amatya kumar gua associate director supply chain and head of strategy and design for flipkart we also have jasjit sethi ceo tci supply chain solutions we have marcus fornell uh, director contract logistics for venus logistics india and we also have atif sayed south asia lead green edge buildings from international finance corporation before we begin this program i will just want to put some setting context setting here as per india economic survey the logistics size of business is about 6.8 to 7% of the total gdp of total 3 trillion dollars atmanirbhar bharat bharat in logistics impacts about 22 million people who are employed in this business altogether we all know that the demand drivers for largely the warehousing business is e-commerce and 3pl and uh, which constitutes about 57 to 58% of the total absorption across the country however e-commerce we are expecting it to grow about 2 and 1/2% half times in 6 years while 3pl we are expecting it to grow in about more than 3x in 6 years can we achieve this as an in india yes of course but we need to prove our competitiveness by bringing in more ease of doing business so we begin our session in this way uh, my first question is to esr india <clears throat> the government of india is concretizing a national logistics policy nlp aiming to increase competitiveness in the sector by bringing in standardization of different stuff related to the logistics which includes big warehouse buildings as well so my question to you is will standardization of warehouse buildings or development norms increase the efficiency and india's competitiveness in the world and do we have benchmarks of some of the indian projects that we can compare with international standards yeah, yeah i could start with that maybe and then prakrut could uh, add on so i think all of us uh, you know all of us in the panel has really gone through this entire this entire journey i think when we all started off there was no there was no warehousing there was no warehousing policy there were no norms when it came to uh, you know the clu norms etc so i think for us the last 4 uh, to 5 years i would say between 3 to 5 years have been uh, uh, you know uh, if you if you ask me in order of 
in actually order, order of priority, I think uh, the entire policy, warehousing, uh, you know, approval processes, et cetera, have been an absolute game changer. I think all the states, uh, like, uh, you know, most of the states have already launched out their plans of how they are going to look at approvals, uh, their master planning, et cetera. So that I would say has been a big help. It helps us plan, uh, you know, it helps us plan. It gives us a surety of approvals, you know, in a way helps us invest into, invest without any risk. The only risk right now left would be that we would actually get approvals in six months or we would get approval in nine months of a year. But, or uh, I think the, uh, so uh, practically getting approvals, getting the regulatory compliances worked out uh, that has really improved. So I, I think I would agree with you, Himendra, that that is the first step. Without that, you really cannot move forward. Large investors are willing to invest into India, but until your policies are not, you know, are not uh, straight, are not, uh, you know, are not understandable, are not, you know, I mean, the implementation does not happen, we're not able to go, you know, we're not able to go full steam ahead. So I think that change has already happened. In terms of standardization, yes, uh, a lot has changed. A lot has changed. I think uh, what uh, what was being built 15 years ago, 12 years ago, 10 years ago. I mean, you have uh, you have uh, you have you know people like like Sharad. You got people like Jasjeet who've been really building building a lot, right? They've been building a lot, but what they build now, vis-a-vis what they used to build uh, seven eight years ago, it's been you know it's been a big change the way you look at facilities, the entire, so standardization will happen and standardization has already started happening. So, which is, uh, which is, you know, which is absolutely a great move, I, I would say. So, Prakrut, do you want to add on to, to what I've said? You're on mute, Prakrut. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Himendra, I think your question was more to do with, uh, you know, how is standardization changing? And that is what uh, Vijit addressed. I'll try and address the second uh, part of your question, which I believe was got to do with, you know, uh, examples or benchmarks of uh, projects in India, which are matching international standards. I, I would rather uh, add one, one aspect, and I'm sure uh, some of the colleagues here would uh, probably resonate what I say. You know that India has also been an innovation bed. Like I'll 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 quote from our learnings with Amazon, and we have today made about five uh, facilities for them. Two already operational, three in fact already operational, and two under making. And the way it works is some of the facilities that are coming up in India. Let's say we are making the country's largest uh, Amazon FC or the the distribution center in Hyderabad. Uh, which is based on the learnings that they have had in in every place from North America to Europe where they operate. And this is going to be probably one of the first of its kind of global facility with the kind of automation going in, et cetera. Uh, uh, I mean, the, you would be aware of it more and I'm sure a lot of our listeners would be aware that uh, every every six months to every nine months, Amazon goes through a huge learning curve. And those uh, things are in fact, incorporated in these buildings. So the building that we started maybe three years ago and the building that we will deliver next year would be a huge difference. I would say it's not just that we are matching international standards. In a lot of cases, we are actually setting international standards in India. Even if you look at uh, an exa example of the building we did for BMW in, in Pune, you know, it was very much in line with their uh, distribution centers that you would find in a Europe or China for that matters, or, or North America. And probably we have bettered it because there has been a lot of learning which has gone in here. So it's it's quite uh, exemplary, I would say, uh, so, to, so to compare. But to answer your question, uh, standardization and uh, a lot of knowledge exchange, which is, which is happening today, has probably pushed our country, you know, to be really, really competitive. Of course, the first mile and last mile delivery issues related, uh, which, which I'm sure others would talk about, would stay and, and I'm sure we are doing, but from a design and uh, standardization perspective, I think, I won't say we have arrived, but we are on the way and we are, we are probably getting there. I guess that's, that should be. 
Thank you, Pratul. So sure. that I will move on to <coughs> Indospace. Sharad, this question is to you. Indospace currently has the largest portfolio of grade A supply in the country, with most investments planned in tier one and large and some of them in tier two as well. So how do you foresee the scale of this space on institutional grade A spanning over next five years for yourself as well as for the other partners put together for the from the country perspective? And from a large uh, long-term perspective, do you also see your uh, real estate investment trusts or the REIT coming in the warehousing sector? Uh, thanks, thanks, Amendra. Um, and firstly, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with such a diverse uh, range of panelists here. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, look, we've clearly benefited from first mover advantage uh, in this industry over the last 12 years. Um, and now Indospace has grown its portfolio to over 50 million square feet uh, and, and growing across over 10 markets. Um, we have seen that investment um, into this space has increased multifold and specifically over the last few years with many new entrants, um, those of which are on the panel today and others, um, you know, and I think that, you know, since it's probably four years, we've seen $5 billion of capital that's been committed to the sector. Um, you've got more joint, joint ventures. It clearly demonstrates that there's more of an institutional appetite for investment into logistics as it now emerges as a bona fide uh, real estate asset class. And, and I think we continuously expect investor interest to be strong, um, which means that existing platforms can grow. Um, new platforms may be created. Um, if things go to plan, we're seeing right now a significant demand surge um, on the back of COVID, which I'll come into in just a second. Um, it, it, it gives us room or ample room for each, each one of us here uh, to take our share of the market. What we are seeing, however, is a, a consolidation start to play out. Um, and that is simply to do with economics. It's simply to do with ability to drive rent growth. Um, we joked about it before the call started, but it would probably be the most highly debated topic if we were all to have a off the record discussion um, at some point. But you know, uh, consolidation as the market continues to mature, I think you'll see further consolidation play out for sure. Um, I guess what's the most important question, again, what we can kind of dive into is um, why is this investor appetite continuously coming in? And I think firstly, we're all aware that during the last 18 months um, during the pandemic, logistics and warehousing was by far not only in India, but globally the most resilient and, and I would say defensive asset class. In, in real estate, when you've seen other asset classes being significantly um, impacted, whether it's residential or offices or hospitality. So I think that's a, a big point where you've seen a pretty seismic shift from institutional capital to de-risk uh, and take kind of long-term capital bets um, in this sector. And you know, whilst during this time, you've also seen supply that's been relatively uh, restrained, right? It's been restricted over the time, you've seen a sharp increase in demand um, driven by what you mentioned earlier on, um, an emergence of e-commerce probably far greater than what we had projected three to four years back. And, and certainly a lot of us are betting on, on e-commerce continuing to rise. But if you look at maybe four or five sectors, oh, sorry, uh, items which would probably contribute to why most of us are in this business um, and certainly will continue to be in this business for five years and beyond is probably the following. Um, there'll continue to be inherent challenges, um, as Abhijit will tell you, you know, over the last 12 years in land acquisitions. And, and that's going to have an impact on all of our ability to provide speculative space on demand. Um, as a result, that should be one of the reasons where we may, in the coming years, actually start to see real rental growth in some of these starved markets which do not have grade A supply available. There's a continued push from the government on uh, a focus to grow manufacturing. We've seen that with the Make in India initiative. We've seen a downturn in that specific segment, but I think a lot of us are at least banking on the next two years to see a pretty sharp recovery from a manufacturing perspective. There's continued investments into FTWZs um, and other incentives being offered 
Um, you've got the national rail and freight corridors that are currently happening um, and being rolled out, which will improve city and statewide connectivity. E-commerce we've mentioned, it's clearly going to continue to cater to these new consumer or consumption patterns that we're seeing, uh, which have been further accelerated by the pandemic. Um, and, and that really, I think, is really kind of servicing that ir irreversible impact on consumer shopping patterns, which are happening. So that will further fuel that growth. We mentioned earlier on um, 3PL industry is going to continue to grow. The businesses are increasingly looking to adopt a, a more omnichannel approach, which is become a pair imperative for them really to survive and grow their businesses. And I think lastly, um, and most importantly, and you're gonna hear many of the panelists, especially my colleague from IFC, you know, we've heard that there's, there's a big push for multinational occupiers to continuously take now lease and, and lease compliance space, grade A space. Um, that is significantly involved. I mentioned earlier on about the, the maybe the differences in what we built um, 10 years back uh, compared to now. And I think that it's moved into, you, you can't just develop a building, you have to develop an ecosystem. And the ecosystem um, has to be survivable. It's got to tick many boxes from the occupier's perspective on the ESG front, from an efficiency front um, and so on. So I think as that continues to uh, increase, uh, we certainly see is a significant opportunity for growth in some of the key key corridors. I think moving on to your more topical question, um, if I may just spend just a minute um, on, on real estate investment trusts. I, from our perspective, um, from my perspective, I, I do think it's early to tell and too early to tell whether or not warehousing and logistics is going to form part of it. We clearly see in mature markets, um, and on Western markets, that there is, there's no distinct distinction between warehousing or other real estate sectors, and, and they kind of coexist. Um, I think where we stand today, with the limited number of REITs that are currently in existence, um, it's going to take a couple of years for more REITs to be established. I think you're going to have to see more healthy trading levels. Um, <clears throat> again, in other countries, and I think what will play out in India at some point, it's given a great opportunity for investors, retail investors, to access the public markets and have exposure to direct real estate. Um, it gives a phenomenal opportunity for developers to have a clear line of liquidity and also further have an opportunity to continue to manage and scale up their businesses. But I think the real question that I know I'm sure or myself or Abhijit for that matter will be asking is will REITs offer <clears throat> as a more competitive valuation as a seller uh, compared to a more traditional private sale that currently exists today. And I don't think there is an answer to that today. So that's really my take. I think you brought a very valid point. Uh, Sharad, uh, I'll move on to uh, Wellspun. Anshul, this question is to you. So e-commerce, uh, which Sharad also mentioned about, uh, even Abhijit and Prakrut also mentioned about, has been the biggest driver in warehousing. About 20 to 25% grade A supply is being absorbed by e-commerce clients. How do you foresee it in the next five to seven years from an absorption perspective for all of us put together? Uh, if we are looking at uh, growing this business on a very large scale, when we are talking of institutions, when we are talking of clients, what do you very interesting. So, uh, so firstly, Sharad and uh, Abhijit, I think, uh, uh, you know, and Pratuk, uh, I think you guys covered some very, very valid points. So uh, it's, it's, uh, you've covered most of the areas that, uh, that one could speak about. Uh, very well said. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, you know, before I answer Imendra's question directly on e-commerce, I think most of us know that the e-commerce story is great. It's going to play out well. You know, everybody, including, you know, my dad, who's 72 now, who never went online a day in his life is now, you know, buying, I keep getting credit card swipes, you know, uh, from my dad, from my 10 year old son. So that's, that's great penetration. I mean, that's just a sign that uh, because of the pandemic, it's growing. So I think that story is, is obvious. E-commerce is today at, you know, 25, 30% of your total absorption. And then there are also another, uh, you know, 30% is a very, very strong, robust 3PL 
customer base, which really, according to me, still keeps warehousing ticking, is the 3PL uh, customers. And I think they are st they still, in my mind, continue to be the most important customer base for us be because they, they are the ones who are bearing the brunt of customer expectations. They are the ones who are bearing the brunt of you know, taking speculative risks or giving build to suit solutions to customers uh, and, and hoping for business. And a lot of their businesses now depend on e-commerce. But, you know, just a, a little more different experience, why I believe warehousing will remain, whether e-commerce slows down, picks up, et cetera, is we just finished a, you know, 500 crore fundraise. We've raised almost the entire fund now and we're opening a green shoe. And uh, we, our fund is very unique from, uh, the rest of my esteemed colleagues on this panel, we are the only fund in India, which is a domestic fund, right? And we reached out to a very different set of investors compared to what, you know, Sharad Abhijit or RK would have reached out to. And everybody told me, you know, domestic fundraise is a nightmare and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, once I got into it uh, and we started meeting these investors, these are very smart HNIs, very smart family offices that have invested in our funds from you know, the Adani family to JK family to Supreme Industries. We've had some really, really good people who put money with us. And uh, they're very smart, well-grounded Indian businessmen, you know. So they obviously know the pulse of the market in India very well. And they've evaluated our fund theses, our investment theses in India being Indian, right? So this is pure domestic capital. Now, domestic investors have a particular return expectation, which you know, they, they have all these various investment opportunities within the country, right? And even then, despite of being a first-time fund manager and a first-time fund with, you know, very little track record in terms of an immediate track record, but of course, a past team track record, they decided and chose us to trust uh, with their money. Uh, and we're very happy to, 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 to make very good progress. Of most of our fund will be deployed in the next few months. But uh, the, the, the point is that because when you meet these varied investors in India and you understand their businesses and we now have access to that network of domestic investors uh, who are very strong in their market. So there's somebody from a Jaipur, somebody from a Ludhiana, somebody from a Indore, somebody from Delhi, of course, people from Bombay, Calcutta are always there. But you start to understand these new domestic Atmanirbhar, which is the topic of our uh, speech, businesses springing up a lot of them now don't need a big distribution network so the manikchans of the world which have you know or the you know the old distributing networks of the world which were there uh, who who have that that on ground distribution network because of online just becoming online you know you don't need that distribution strength anymore right you need a strong brand promise and a brand proposition as a business right and that move that that one change alone that one sentiment alone with all these you know indians are very very entrepreneurial and innovative i mean we could we could we made an opportunity out of demonetization right so i mean we could do anything so uh, so with this whole shift happening uh, in the way india is now beginning to operate with the government now putting in at least 10 to 15 atmanirbhar schemes and i could lift, list them all uh, you know, I'm on the uh, board of uh, Ashocham as the chairman for the logistics and warehousing committee, and we have regular interactions with the government. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are seeing the kind of effort they are putting in. And obviously, it's it, it there's talk and then there's action. And it takes time for the talk to convert into action. But the next 10 years is great. I mean, if, if even 50% or 30% of those plans succeed, there is a lot of domestic inherent demand which will continue to drive storage and logistical requirements. Along with this, uh, and this is something that I think Abhijit is, is probably, and Sharad, of course, would know very, very well, uh, is that the spec of the buildings. So today, we were, you know, <laughs> there is a customer we were talking to in one of our parks for 200,000 square feet, and now the same customer wants 1.1 million square feet, right? And uh, that's crazy. I mean, you know, for the same customer in a period of four months to go up to 1.1 million with a very, very high spec building uh, with, with higher floors, uh, sorry, higher heights, more, uh, more, uh, you know, more automation that they are planning. The, the design of the warehouse is changing. The product is changing. Now with all this happening 
and land acquisition continuing to remain a challenge. Construction costs at an all time high, right? My, I am bullish and I have to be, I don't have a choice, otherwise I can't live bullish on rents going up, right? But, 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 the, but the sector is going to get very, very professional, very matured, uh, very consolidated as Sharad said, and that will only result in, in, in a very uh, polished, uh, in a very well, uh, well manicured warehousing business over time, because unfortunately, if a, if a local developer wants to get into this space, you know, they have to come in with significant capital. Otherwise, it, it, it won't make, make any sense beyond the point. And ultimately, you know, Sharaj or Abhijit will go and acquire them. So, uh, so, so the, the, the nutshell I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is from both from a domestic investor confidence, giving the backbone of the economy to e-commerce being e-commerce, pandemic being pandemic, uh, you know, the demand drivers, engines within the country without being affected by external factors is so high that uh, that the next 10 years in warehousing, yeah, there'll be ups and downs, there'll be quarters where the demand is low, there'll be quarters where it's high. But overall, the curve should be, should be steady. And as long as we have good quality institutional developers like, like the ones on this panel who continue to drive the bulk of the market, you know, the decisions will be sensible. And as long as those decisions are sensible, we should all be, uh, you know, we should all be in good hands. So that, that's it from me. Thank you, Anshu. I think uh, you brought up quite a few topics. I, I think we can keep on debating it over the next two hours. Uh, but I think uh, the second one more point that comes into mind is about tier two towns. And what is this is what we've been saying. Uh, this is a question to RK, sir, Al Corporate Logistics. Uh, as per JLL estimates, the entire warehousing space in all top 100 cities across the country, A plus B plus C categories put together, is about 760 million square foot. Out of which grade A and grade B is not more than 238 million square foot. So what does that mean? We have a lot to cover on the tier two cities as well. The question to you is, so dynamics are definitely pushing warehousing to tier two towns. How do you see tier two towns warehousing tilting towards grade A supply and why? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks, there. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just talk about more from perspective of uh, you know, firstly from perspective of uh, you know the demand, uh, and therefore the penetration into tier two and tier three of the e-tailers and uh, of the three uh, PL companies, and therefore you know the naturally movement towards uh, from grade C to grade B or grade B to grade grade A, that will happen. See, we are talking about, first of all, it's, it's known that India is a very big uh, you know, retail market and growing. And within that, the percentage of uh, e-tail, e-retail component, that's, that's been even growing further. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, in, in terms of certain data points, we've got 40 cities, which have a population of 1 million plus. We've got 718 districts. And uh, e-tail today, in some form or the other, you know, one product or the other, they serve pretty much 95% of India's PIN code. I mean, you will be surprised, you know, as per one of the study given by Bain, a uh, consulting firm, uh, for example, the number of percentage of PIN codes served, you know, uh, when ordered online. For fashion products, it's 98%. For electronic devices and accessories, it's 97%. And for mobile phones, it's been 95%. So that's the kind of penetration of that 718 districts that we are talking about. Even in terms of growth in the pandemic year, you know, over tier one market, the total uh, gross uh, merchandise value, you know, that uh, versus the tier one market, the gross merchandise value has increased by, you know, rather it was two and a half to three times over what the tier two, tier one markets were. And even in terms of shares of new customer acquisition, uh, the pie, you know, the total pie, the 80% 80, 80 has been by uh, these tier two and tier three, three, uh, three cities. So we are talking of uh, you know some huge numbers. So those are numbers in aggregate, uh, and it's also it's also not that uh, you know uh, one is talking about small smaller price products or products getting ordered which are differentiated in products. I think in terms of average sale price of so what you see in the metro or the tier one cities, again as for the same uh, report, uh, you know there, there's hardly any difference in terms of uh, you know the percentage difference in terms of the average sales price. So pretty much the demand is there. How to serve this demand, you know, that's that's been the question. 
uh, you know, for, for e-commerce companies, while they consolidate their position, increase the box size, et cetera, in tier one markets, but in tier two markets also, you know, uh, e-commerce first and 3PL also, uh, you know, that's kind of their, uh, you know, growth market. They're already penetrating there, but I would tend to think that in terms of aggregate volumes, uh, the tier two market also, tier two or tier three markets also will actually, you know, uh, be, be a very, very big percentage. So to your question, um, you know, uh, the shift from grade C or grade B to grade A, it is a natural moment, I would say one, because obviously as more sophisticated customers or the users of these warehouses, uh, which is your uh, e-commerce to begin with and 3PL and then others, and also Anshul referred to earlier about uh, you know, your traditional distribution network or the traditional uh, CNF, uh, which was serving mostly the local retailers. And, and because the local retail uh, consumption is getting split between, or rather, you know, it's getting increasing towards the e-commerce. So therefore uh, you have now a different uh, set of distribution network happening, uh, which is in the form of e-commerce as well as uh, 3PL companies. So naturally the demand towards uh, grade A uh, will increase because nobody is compromising these end clients are not compromising on clients uh, on uh, efficiency, on uh, compliances, and uh, various other factors. You know, which which uh, earlier was the case. So there is bound to be a shift from grade A, I mean, from from grade B to grade A. In addition to that, the new demand, uh, you know, we will also is also coming in because of the factors you know that I mentioned. Uh, now, in terms of categories, uh, you know, what you expect? Of course, it all started, and a lot of it got boosted because of uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, and and, uh, and and the categories which were most prominent to begin with were, you know, your traditional select categories like mobile, elect electronics, appliances, things like that. Then you gradually move towards uh, groceries and household because these items, personal care items, household, groceries, they're all regular items, you know, which you order, which are, which have repeat purchases. Clothing, you know, these are all uh, repeat purchases. So, uh, accordingly, the e-commerce companies, because they all have different formats of their own warehouses, which uh, cater to different different categories. Uh, so accordingly, the demand that you will see coming in from them. Uh, in terms of sizes, I would tend to think that you will still not see probably, except for in few select tier two markets, probably you will still not see a 500,000, 600,000 square foot of box, maybe on an average for e-commerce companies, it'll be 200 to 300,000 they'll always retain the option of another 200, 300,000. But on an average uh, from other categories, you will see you know, probably 100,000 to 200,000 kind of size. So, so the average size uh, would be less. The average scale of a logistic park would be less. I would tend to think that a 25, 30 acres or 35 acres would be good enough. Whereas in main markets, we obviously look at 50 acre plus kind of a scenario. Now, these are all we are talking in terms of, uh, you know, serving the consumption market. But, uh, you know, uh, in, in bigger cities, you also have the industrial clients, the light engineering clients. I think that will take time. That would get driven by, you know, maybe if some large industry gets set up in uh, one of the uh, capital city or, you know, one of the other prominent city, then surrounding that, uh, you could see ancillaries coming in and uh, depending on the product type, you know, accordingly as uh, storage, uh, you know, for, for such uh, sub-components. Uh, even Government of India's push of one district, one product, which is more oriented towards exports, uh, you know, and therefore a sourcing base uh, also might lead in certain, uh, you know, uh, districts or, you know, uh, you know state uh, capital uh, also seeking for some of these demands. So this is where I would say, I think the natural course of movement uh, will see the shift from, uh, you know, grade B, a great C to grade A. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, sir. Thank you so much. I think uh, a lot of points have been coming in. So we've moved from a developer perspective to look from a perspective of a 3PL service provider. We have Jajit Sethi, uh, CEO from TCI Supply Chain. Jajit, sir, this is a question to you. So 3PL logistic service provider brings in most important elements storage, elements of storage, distribution, and increasing efficiency for the client. But if I have to compare a 3PL managed warehouses as against the end user or own facility, which is managed by themselves, how is 3PL different and what are the value propositions? Because this question keep on coming constantly from different angles. So I think if you can throw some light on this, it will become easier. 
great question and uh, thank you for asking that uh, there are a lot of people in this room who i think are quite aware of uh, the positives uh, of this but let me enumerate a few of them you know first of all you know warehousing is not equal to a uh, building uh, what we get delivered from the developers is basically a box what happens inside the box is completely on the 3 pm and while there are many components to it, for sake of simplicity, let me talk of just two or three. One is, of course, what is the infra inside the warehouse, which is the racking system, the storage stuff, and also the metal handling. Second part is the processes around it. How do we ensure that every square foot of the warehouse is utilized properly? Now, rental is same for the warehouse, be it in the front or at the rear. We have to ensure that we maximize the entire warehouse in space. And third is the systems around it. So, you know, typically there were about seven, eight uses of a warehouse. It could be a distribution center for a B2B. It could be a fulfillment center. It could be a hub. It could be a cross stock. It could be a vendor managed inventory. It could be aftermarket warehouse. So they are different utilization of the same warehouse space. It is a 3PL who understands how to work in these and what are the better set of systems and the infra processes, people, and systems for these? And what he brings to a table besides this is also his cross learning. For example, at ECI, uh, we have done more than 100 visits to factories across the world. E commerce in India came in 2010. We have been visiting places in Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, the US since 2005. And in terms of you know, where we are today, we are still not really up there where we, we could have gone. We are still a uh, work in progress. So uh, the understanding what is good for India now was going to be good for India five years hence and 10 years hence in terms of both automation is still a far way off. Uh, what we get in Virasa today in India is also a little bit, you know, if I were to say in the last 15 years, we haven't really progressed. And I qualify that remark. Typically, warehousing and all the people in the room will agree is about location, location, location. Uh, it is to be part of an overall logistics and supply chain. What has happened as the boxes have become bigger, it's become more of a finance play with larger people coming in and large pieces of land are not available where we want it to be. So they're a little bit here and there off the center. So the supply chain actually becomes more longer and more complicated. That is one problem. Second is that these prefab boxes start coming in 2004 and 5 itself. What has happened now in terms of the quality, in terms of the standards, in terms of national building standards, they have gone up. In terms of firefighting systems, they have gone up. They have become larger. But it, they still haven't uh, come to the status of a smart box. Many of the play of e-commerce and other players is not really very exacting. It is mostly shelving. It's not really something we're using a uh, very high amount of uh, automation of a VNA or, uh, you know, machinery which requires super flat floor. We are still a little bit, you know, we are happy with what we have got, but we really not have reached that level of standards in terms of warehouses also. So what, what happens while these uh, bigger developers have pretty logistics parks, which are not really on the center, they are off center. The challenges have remained for the overall supply chain. The report which was just mentioned spoke about the need for warehousing in city centers. Now, if I were to ask anybody in this room, can you give me a 200,000 box in Delhi? Because I need it in Delhi. Can anyone give me that? If someone does it, I am a customer tomorrow. So it's all about location, but not location which they have, location which we want. So end of the day for logistics cost to come down and supply chain being better, it is important that we, we are, yes, done a great job from small to bigger boxes, large ecosystems. The next step is to see where the boxes should be located. I think the next victory for anybody in the room would not be having more boxes in far flung of places, but where it should be. And that will require a lot of work along with the government agencies. I believe Maharashtra already has done some work on that in terms of making things easy and compliant. Maybe work with this like Delhi, Kolkata, Bangalore to see what lands are available either of railway and others and to capitalize on that. Because if you see all cities, even look at a Tokyo, they would have a 8, 10 story where truck goes up all the way. 
and those are in the city centers. But if, if you look at for Delhi, uh, what happens? It's offset in Haryana. So every day you have so much traffic coming to the city. The do- roads are always clogged. Why do we have so much traffic? Why do we only have uh, 50 cars per 1,000 people? US has got 600. It's only because of this poor logistics, which is because we are mushrooming the warehouses wherever we get farmland and convert it. It is not really coming where it should be. So the, I think the next play for logistics costs and efficiency to come down would be there. And as a 3PL player, we try to be in the OD basis, origin, destination. Where can we be in the best place? Yeah. So I hope that answers the question for you. I think, yeah, um, I'll put it this way. Uh, We have one more panel who will also discuss on the same uh, point because it's more debatable from a perspective of uh, where it should be, where it should not be. Can it be the in-city or can it be not the in-city? But I think we have that question for some other panel member who will come to that. But uh, a lot of good insights from your side, from a 3 pl perspective. I I just want to speak, you know, if it's okay with with you, I just want to give a little answer to Jazzy's on what uh, what his question was. And it's extremely important what you said. In fact, as a, as a company across the world, we are building ground up. And you know, in the end of the day, in city, in city locations, the country's logistic will improve drastically only when you start getting in city distribution right. The problem in India is we ourselves have spent a lot of time. We spent about a year getting the, you know, getting the designs, the costing, the plans, everything set. And I'm sure the other you know, three panelists would also have their plans completely ready to, you know, go forward. We know exactly what we got to build. We know what the costs are. We know what design will work for India. The problem, Jasjeet, is always here is going to be land acquisitions, policies, policies, the approval processes, and also to some extent costs. You know, in the end of the day, land value in India vis-a-vis the rentals that you can really pay for in-city distribution, there is a big gap. Right, so it's twofold. One is your, uh, one is your entire land acquisition strategy. Second is your approval processes. Third is your actual cost that you know vis-a-vis the land, you know the land values. But I can assure you here, you know, I can assure you, Jazji, that one of the three, four people in this room very soon will be will start these locations. I think in-city distribution is the name of the game. I think in the next few years, you will be seeing many such boxes start springing up because it is a big need of the hour. And, you know, if you look at Sandeep, I mean, you know, Flipkart, I mean, uh, most of the e-commerce players, most of the e-commerce players across India are looking at that. I mean, it could be e-commerce, 3PL, you know, so many other factors are looking at that. So time's about to come, but still, uh, you know, challenges still remain here. I mean, still stages deep. Thanks, thanks, Abhijit. Uh, so this question is... Uh, sorry, even I'd like to just add to, to just of 30 seconds on that. And I completely second what Abhijit said. You know, we've got everything nailed to the to the last team, including design, column loads, you know, floor loads, docks, number of elevators, ramps, everything, right? All sorts of options ready. But, uh, but acquiring land in in-city locations today with the FSI norms uh, that, are, that are available, with the setback norms that are available... Right, require a significant amount of rental inflow uh, to make that economically viable, and that has to be tried. Right, and I think all of us are going to go do it anyway because that's all of us want to try it anyway. Right, but it has to be a, a give and take relationship between customers and developers, where you know if it's solving the need of the final throughput of last mile, then it does have a cost attached. You know, and that cost has to be, otherwise it will not never make any investment sense and we'll continue to remain inefficient with our logistic supply chains. So, you know, as, as long as the, the economics do not become viable, all of us are backed by funds and investors. All of us have return expectations. You know, it's great to solve solutions, but if those solutions don't make any money, then there's no point in solving them, right? So, uh, so that's going to remain a challenge, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, for for developers. But at the same time, nobody disagrees that last mile is 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 the name of the game. I'm very glad that you guys have launched a white paper today on that. Uh, it's very heartening to see that. Thanks, thanks, Anshu. So I'm, I'm think... glad you guys agree to that point that that's a need of the hour. I think the there are two parts to it. One, currently, what we have done, we have kind of you know, shared care of the government agencies 
and gone for land acquisition and then looked at the government for compliances. Here, the play is going to be a bit different. As I mentioned, most of your play has been around funds. So this is a need of the R and anybody who cracks that in the right way, it could be a leasehold land from the government with something from the airport which comes in. Uh, so only when you have a property on hand yeah. can we discuss about the pricing. Currently, there's nothing available, but there are other unorganized players who are still there in that. So I believe that's the last frontier for you guys to come in, maybe, you know, with your, you know, depth of uh, association which you guys have. Look at that as a potential, and it would really help solve the country's problems for logistics. Thank you. I think a uh, good point brought out by all the panel members. I think, Hemendra, you should organize a brainstorming session between some customers and developers together. You know, we put developers together and three, four customers together uh, on in city, and that might actually. I think uh, I think we have a question. Uh, Anshul, we have a question for Flipkart on the same thing, and I'm taking that he question can, right now. You can start by organizing the land for sure. <laughs> <laughs> start I, working with the I, government then. I agree, Abhijit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll this topic is for the Flipkart. In uh, the report that we've launched today. The demand that we foresee in for next one and a half year itself is about 7 million square feet. Uh, so the, this question uh, is, what do you think is the value proposition of dark stores in present condition? Some part of it is definitely said by Justice sir. But from your perspective, how do you see that? And in the long term, do you see a new real estate type emerging from these urban cities for particular kind of uh, in-city kind of real estate? Do we have? We had somebody from Flipkart, Amartya. I think then we'll move on to another topic. So this uh, question is from automation perspective to Rinas. Uh, Marcus, uh, for you, everyone is talking of automation inside the box to make the operations leaner and faster. However, automation requires additional investments. So in India, we were earlier thinking of cheap labor costs had always been a major reason for users not to migrate to automation. Does that still hold good? And what is the cost delta for manual as against automated for the occupiers? Thanks, Aminda. Um, yeah, thanks for your question on this uh, indeed very um, important and relevant subject. Moving a bit away from the uh, earlier gist of the discussion, I would just um, to round up the um, uh, the earlier bit and the uh, comments by the other, other panelists, I would just like to um, uh, make some comment uh, with regards to standardization of the boxes and the warehouses uh, uh, that we have seen um, uh, by all the major developers who are here on the panel. And uh, we are talking about, uh, from our perspective, Venus you know, Logistics, we have also seen a lot of international um, clients, the international visitors who have seen our uh, facilities and uh, who can indeed confirm that um, the quality of the warehousing that we see coming up in India uh, is indeed um, uh, at par with international standard. Uh, we have heard this, uh, uh, some of the facilities are, uh, are setting new standards. So that's something which is also confirmed um, by some of our clients, some of our overseas clients who come and visit our facilities. So uh, also a big thank you to um, driving this, um, uh, driving these initiatives. Um, coming or uh, leading over to the um, other subject and uh, to your question, Um So talking about um, uh, yeah, automation, uh, standardization, uh, etc. Um, uh, if you talk about the entire uh, subject, uh, I go back to one of your initial comments or, or statements about uh, logistics costs in India. So logistics costs in India are yet um, amongst the highest in the world, uh, with about 14%. And that in spite of uh, every individual uh, element of the input uh, cost being uh, the lowest or possibly amongst the lowest in the world. So India has the lowest labor cost, India has um, the lowest costs for um, uh, for trucks, for vehicles, uh, uh, and for many other input factors, and yet the overall logistics costs um, are amongst the highest. So in order to for India to be competitive, uh, it 
requires a very robust and uh, a very robust supply chain and uh, infrastructure. And warehousing uh, uh, plays indeed plays a crucial role here. Um, uh, one part, obviously, the box um, standardization of the box, which we have been talking about, and uh, apart from that, from that, obviously, standardization inside the warehouse and uh, standardization um, and automation between the legs of uh, the different parts of the supply chain, not only warehouse, but also transportation from the inbound warehousing to the outbound. So when we talk about um, uh, competitive, uh, competitiveness in warehousing, we need to shift uh, away the focus um, a bit from uh, looking at one particular aspect of the supply chain, which may be labor cost or automation, and we need to take a more a holistic view, uh, how do we uh, bring end-to-end -end efficiencies uh, to the supply chain? And that only uh, works through um, standardization. Uh, we talk about unitization, palletization, uh, et cetera, and, uh, and automation. Uh, automation is only possible uh, uh, once we standardize. So standardization and automation work hand in hand. Um, as Renos, we have also uh, worked on a um, on a white paper on standardization um, uh, together with the Indian uh, government and Mr. Farhan Agarwal uh, just a few months um, uh, back. Uh, this white paper was released um, fairly recently as well and uh, talks about standardization and automation as one uh, major aspect for uh, yeah, competitiveness. And uh, that is uh, yeah, something which will drive uh, the next, uh, the upcoming two to three years. Um, today, customers also look for uh, real-time visibility in the supply chain, speed to market, increase of flexibility, scalability. Uh, uh, in order to achieve that, uh, we need uh, standardization and we need uh, automation. So to come back to your original question, uh, yes, uh, India has uh, been uh, experiencing cheaper labor cost um, and um, uh, cheaper labor cost as compared to the relatively high investment into automation automation uh, has uh, slowed down uh, automation in India in the uh, in the past uh, as compared to other countries um, but uh, what we see and what we see in the coming uh, what we will certainly see in the next two or three years uh, is that uh, there will be a paradigm shift in the uh, industry. Uh, there will be um, a shift towards more automation, towards more technology in order to achieve efficiencies, in order to, uh, uh, to achieve economies of scale. Um, so certainly uh, one uh, very important subject. And uh, yeah, just apart from that, uh, we also see the labor costs increasing um, on an annual basis, we had uh, we have seen a lot of uncertainties um, uh, more recently, and at the same time, the cost of technology. Um, I think there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of parties, a lot of uh, very innovative companies uh, that have been participating also in uh, this year's India Warehousing uh, Show um, are working uh, with tremendous efforts towards um, making technology. Uh, and making automation also more cost effective. So with the cost, uh, uh, with the cost of uh, technology and automation coming down and cost of labor going up, you will see, you will certainly see a change um, uh, in the Indian market uh, in the coming years. Thanks. thanks um, maybe, uh, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, I think the second question was with regards to cost difference. Yes. Yeah. So maybe just uh, just very brief. So when we talk about automation, we talk about different um, levels of automation, right? Uh, so level one would possibly describe or would describe the um, moving from a pure manual operation to a um, technology or automation supported uh, operation. Uh, uh, we typically typically talk about the processes like inbound, outbound, uh, scanning enabled processes, uh, which are uh, achievable with uh, um, uh, yeah, fairly minimal investments and which, uh, uh, with which we can achieve uh, certainly uh, productivity increases uh, in the range of 10, 15%, sometimes more, uh, sometimes a bit less. 
And uh, part of that, uh, part of the investment will certainly be offset by uh, the productivity increases. And customers are uh, uh, indeed willing to pay um, uh, a, a bit of premium uh, for technology uh, because, again, we are not just talking about um, uh, pure productivity and comparing of the uh, of the pure input cost, but we also talk about uh, error-free operation, wastage in the supply chain, and wherever. Uh, uh, humans are involved, there will be errors. So uh, I think that's one of the very important takeaways um, uh, for error-free operation, for uh, real-time visibility, for data accuracy, uh, analytics, um, uh, we do indeed require automation and uh, technology. Thanks. Talking about the second level of automation, that is more about um, fully automated warehouses, fully automated retrieval systems, um, systems, sorting, etc. cetera, um, uh, warehousing using robotics. Uh, that is something which uh, we will probably see or which we are seeing in, uh, amongst the large e-commerce players. Uh, however, in the, um, I, I feel that that is uh, for others, 3PL and smaller uh, to mid-size operations, that is something which would uh, certainly certainly take a bit more time. We will see elements of automation automation here, but fully automized warehouses um, uh, will probably take a bit more time buying the large e-commerce players. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. I think we have a last question for Atif. This is regarding green buildings. From automation to sustainability, as a trend, more and more organized logistics parks are preparing themselves to be environmentally conscious. So they are going in for green certification, solar installations. A uh, couple of questions from our side. What are the benefits of having a green warehouse? And what is the delta in cost of making it green? And how does developer recover this cost in real terms? Thanks, Amendra. Uh, how much time do I have? About six minutes. OK, great. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Mip. And maybe for uh, the sake of audience members who may not be familiar with IFC, uh, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank. And we primarily are a develop development organization which invests in certain projects, but we are also providing advisory services, which is where me and my team comes in. Uh, our primary focus is on green buildings, uh, including green warehouses and we have a few of our uh, investee partners on this panel as well, where we provided both uh, investment as well as uh, advisory support on their warehouses. So to answer your question on the cost and benefit of green certification or a green design, let me first talk about three primary benefits. Uh, and then I'll talk about the cost. So the, the one or the most obvious benefit that one typically thinks of when talking about green design is operational savings. And this is where maybe the, the concept of Atmanirbhar Bharat also can be applied down to the level of the individual warehouse. Now we know that uh, according to some estimates, roughly 10 to 15% of the operational cost for running a warehouse goes into its utilities. So energy, water, et cetera. And we also know that the government subsidies on electricity is going away in, in many parts of the country. In fact, it has been privatized in many parts. So the, the subsidy is com completely gone in those parts. So now the, the prices are going up. So maybe that 10 to 15% might become even higher. So according to us, an Aat Nirbhar warehouse is one that can substantially reduce its operational cost by reducing firstly its energy demand through good design, and then wherever feasible, supplement it with solar photovoltaics, with on-site renewable energy. So that is, uh, that is a great way of being self-reliant. Now, a good example of this are the warehouses that are built, built by GMR for, uh, in Hyderabad for the Amazon Fulfillment Center, which we just certified last month. Uh, the green design of these warehouses reduced their energy bills by 77% as compared to the baseline. So that means their monthly electricity bill has gone down by 77% and with a payback of just about 2.3 years on the additional investment to make them green. So that's on the, the cost benefit side, but there are other benefits too. The second big reason for building green is to future-proof these assets. 
as you we you know many large occupiers and investors are now looking to invest and occupy only green certified spaces as sharad had hinted before uh, for example cdc which is the investment arm of the uk government has invested in tvs uh, tvs industrial and logistics park for construction of new warehouses all of which are supposed to meet uh, the green standards are provided by edge by our organization uh, many global e-commerce giants have similar requirements on sustainability now on the warehouse design and if a warehouse is not meeting such a green standard then it is obvious they are losing out on a big business opportunity with those kind of clients similarly government policies are also now becoming more stringent with regards to building codes and mandates and it won't be a big surprise if non green buildings if the brown buildings being built now become obsolete or redundant in a few years and require expensive retrofits just to bring them up to par with the standards at that time the third big reason for developers to get green certification according to us would be uh, the the uh, ability to unlock access to green finance uh now since paris climate accord which happened what 2012 a lot of green or climate finance has been now made available internationally and sometimes it's available with preferential terms to projects that meet a certain green criteria our edge certification aligns with most of these international criteria and has actually helped some of our clients get access to green finance uh, one great example is indospace which has uh, received a, a 1000 crore green loan by hsbc uh, to finance some of their new edge certified warehouses and there are numerous other opportunities and investors of similar name now but they require a certain criteria to be met now to answer your concerns on the capital cost uh, as we've seen in some of the example that i mentioned it can be limited it can be contained however this needs some proper planning up front and we have developed a fairly straightforward system Uh, through our edge software and uh, our edge uh, certification which helps optimize these design cost find out the best option available for our project for your project and find out what does it cost and what is the the benefit of it in terms of operational savings and also carbon emission savings which is a, actually a reporting metric for the green finance all one needs to do is go to uh, our free online platform called edgebuildings.com edgebuildings.com and enter the basic information about your warehouse so this is a free platform so any of you can uh, can get this done for your current designs also and in less than 10 to 15 minutes you can evaluate multiple design options for your projects so currently where it stands where the baseline is and what else can be done to make this even more efficient and what the payback would be so as a result it becomes very easy for developers to figure out the optimum cost of making the project green many of our certified projects have uh, paybacks of between 1 to 3 years which is quite reasonable which means that after that payback period is over all the savings will then accrue to their bottom line so this is this is actually a fairly straightforward way and as i said green is not just of uh, solar panels there are a lot of other ways of uh, getting green and uh, there are measures related to lighting air conditioning if it is an air conditioned warehouse uh, and also many other uh, aspects of uh, the operational aspect so finally before i close uh, i would like to congratulate indospace which has just reached a milestone because we've been working with them uh, just this week they've uh, reached the 1 crore square feet milestone for their green warehouse space as certified by edge system so that's a major milestone and we we hope many others would also join this uh, this limited uh, group so thank you and back to you thank you very much congratulations sharad that's a big achievement it is and continuing to grow yeah with the support of iofc yeah thank you thank you so much i think we will invite some questions from the audience First question is again to Abhijit. Is Abhijit in there? Prabhu, are you there? No, I guess he he had to drop out. Uh, but I am happy to answer any questions that come in. Yeah, this so is I about the initiative on the environment, social, and governance in building sure. new warehouses. 
from Alok Kumar. Yeah, hi, hi, Alok. Uh, I hope you're there. Uh, so, Alok, I'll I'll take that question and answer on behalf of Abhijit. So, uh, Alok, just to give you a little idea, but uh, ESG is very much at the heart of uh, the core belief system at ESR, and uh, we've been taking ample uh, steps towards uh, making ourselves a very, very ESG-oriented, ESG-compliant kind of an organization. So just to give you a brief, and I, I'm sure we don't have too much time, but to take you through, but we, we do have a full-fledged uh, presentation on the ESG. Our ESG strategy is based on three key, uh, I would say, pillars. So one is on the human centricity of it. So all our parks are are designed with uh, you know keeping uh, the the human element in mind. Uh, second is obviously on the portfolio part, and third on the corporate performance part. But uh, just to give you a quick glimpse of what we are doing, uh, I think Atif just mentioned about uh, green building. So we are uh, we are we are uh, uh, completely uh, going green in India on, and actually across APAC. So all our parks today are uh, IGBC silver rated. <coughs> what we have been trying to do with this is, uh, firstly, obviously we we end up uh, sourcing locally sourced materials which are, you know, recycled and obviously recyclable. Uh, we tend to use uh, you know optimum natural light. So any any building that you go to, and I'm more than happy to welcome you to some of our buildings that we have made and delivered, uh, and you'll you'll probably realize it yourself. So we try and make sure the design, at the design stage, the buildings are designed to make sure we capture and use, uh, you know, as much as natural light as possible, which obviously, you know, reduces the dependency on artificial lighting and hence the overall uh, cost saving that you would get in, in terms of energy conservation. Next is obviously most all our parks are very, very energy, energy efficiently designed. So, you know, uh, uh, reducing wastewater or rather uh, reutilizing waste, wastewater. In fact, uh, at our Chennai park, we did an efficiency study and we realized that uh, we would end up reducing the water usage in, in that park uh, by about 70% by recycling the water itself. Other, other things like, uh, you know, responsible waste management, uh, you know, uh, making making sure that all our buildings are uh, capable of taking solar panels. So you would start seeing in the next three years that most uh, ESR buildings would would be you know, solar enabled. So our strategy is in fact ready to be rolled out somewhere in the second quarter of 2022. But all our buildings today are developed uh, with keeping the solar panels in mind. So in case a client wants, even today, I mean, without doing anything much, uh, you could. Uh, probably you know, install solar panels and make sure your building is highly energy efficient. Over and above that, obviously, we every every state that we go to, you know, we tie up with local governments there, local authorities there, at times even NGOs, to make sure everything from you know save the girl or girl education, <coughs> generating local employments, all of these are initiatives that we usually take. Uh, I mean that that was in a nutshell, but if there is any other question, particularly I look uh, happy to answer them. We don't have any more questions from all. Sure. Uh, closing remarks from each one of you. Prima, can we have that? <clears throat> sure, I can I can start. Uh, you know, I think I think it was it was a brilliantly uh, hosted and I think very well moderated session. Uh, Hemendra, thank you for that. And uh, I I'm glad that I I attended the session. I think every every place, uh, be it uh, you know Anshul or uh, Sharad or Arkesar or Atif, you know each one of you, the ideas that we got were really really well worth taking. I have a few questions, uh, in fact, for a couple of panelists, but I think I'll do that one on one whenever I meet. So Marcus, I'll probably reach out to you on automation. And Atif, I'll reach out to you on a few things uh, for the edge building thing. So um, I, I am working with the team at projects uh, to implement a couple of things. And a few things that you mentioned were really, really worth exploring. And I'm going to do that uh, maybe on an offline session. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Rima. And thank you, Hemendra. Great session to have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hemendra, I think 
uh, from my side, I just want to say thank you for moderating. I think the questions were very poignant. Um, I think they were highly topical. And certainly, I know that already Abhijit and I are debating over WhatsApp on some of the points, and we'll continue to do so. Um, it was really interesting uh, to hear from Renus, to hear from IFC, to hear from uh, Just G, the TCI, um, alternative viewpoints from various parts of the, you know, for the, of the industry. And I think that's really important. Um, so I, I think the way that the, the forum has been put together um, was very informative. And look, ultimately, from the developer perspective and, and the investor perspective, we're here to improve the sector and to make it more efficient, to make it more compliant, and hopefully make it more profitable. Um, ultimately with scale. So I think the more like-minded like, like individuals that you have, um, the more they can come together, we, it's only going to be good for the industry. So thank you very much for the chat. Thank you, sir. Arke, sir, closing remarks. No, uh, very interesting sessions uh, here to, uh, you know, to hear from all the panel members. And uh, you know, first of all, Sharad, congratulations on that 10 million Mark for green building and uh, out there's a lot of things to pick up from uh, you guys. I think that's a great amount of work that has been done. And uh, Marcus, uh, so many things to learn from your side. And Jajit, uh, I, I think what you said about uh, you know how, how to match uh, the the two uh, you know in terms of cost, particularly on the in city side, that's our goal as well. Uh, but you know as Abhijit had pointed out, uh, various constraints you know on the land side, on the policy side. I hope together we can work uh, with the government uh, and uh, you know try to get these things down and put down the logistics cost, uh, you know, for, for all of us. Uh, yes, even yes. the well conducted session. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, Judge sir. I think we never not able to complete that topic, but yes, closing remarks from your side. Highly debatable one. Much much to discuss about. Yeah. So uh, I, I think as a country, we are going in the right direction. Uh, despite the policy bottleneck which we have faced, and I really compliment the people in this room for having done their bit. Uh, I think the next step probably is when the policy framework also is an enabler rather than working around it, working with it. So this has been a good session, and I think while we may compete in some areas, we also have to look at being complementing from a very long point of long time point of view. So probably this is a good platform. We could explore it and take this further and discuss out areas where uh, we can pool our resources and see what works out for all of us. Uh, because end of the day, we are all going to be a part of that same ecosystem. And none of us can have a 100% market share. So, you know, I think uh, we have to both compete as well as collaborate wherever we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus, you are Iman. Thanks, Aminda. Um... Yeah, I can only uh, agree with uh, uh, all the previous uh, speakers. I think it was a very interesting session. As rightly said, uh, way too short. There are various subjects um, which are worth um, uh, deliberating uh, a lot more. I'm sure uh, a specific session for green warehousing, uh, but also specific session uh, uh, with regards to automation and standardization uh, would certainly be uh, very exciting, also very exciting for the audience to get uh, a lot deeper into uh, the subject um, and uh, would certainly be uh, happy to uh, be part of any further uh, such discussions where we can further deep dive. Um, yeah, apart from that, I can uh, uh, only see that uh, in India as a whole and uh, 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 especially looking at uh, uh, yeah, all the speakers, uh, be it uh, from ESR, Industries, Oil Cargo, Velspan, uh, all you guys, um, uh, you're driving um, the change in the Indian logistics market and uh, you're driving the modernization of the uh, um, uh, warehouse space. Uh, please continue the same way. I think uh, we have seen a tremendous change, a tremendous improvement. Uh, and I would just like to add one comment. Uh, uh, it's not only the, uh, I would say it's a, uh, it's a major players um, and it's you guys who are driving this uh, development, but there are also um, uh, many local players who have really uh, 
uh, yeah, really managed to uh, move up uh, the game and uh, also uh, deliver very good projects um, as well. So uh, there's also competition uh, coming up from that side, uh, certainly inspired by uh, by the development, uh, but making sure that this uh, continues to be a very interesting um, market. So thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, Parkwood, RK and all others will be um, delighted to uh, connect more offline and um, uh, yeah, for further discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank and you. thank you, Minda, for moderating that session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amendr. Uh, so very informative session, especially to hear from all the industry champions about the current ambitions and the challenges that the industry is facing. Uh, well, we cannot really help on all of those, but we think that on the sustainability side, especially, uh, we can definitely provide support. And we think it's not just a moral responsibility, but also a fiscal responsibility that the growth that this industry is expecting is more efficient, more sustainable, environmentally friendly. And now it's easier than ever before to finance that. And we'll be glad to support uh, you and others on this sustainable journey. So thanks thank again you. for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you panel members, all of you for being part of this show. Over to you, Rima. Great. Thank you so much, Himendra, and uh, all the speakers for sharing your thoughts. Indeed, a great session. And I'm sure today's takeaway will be, will be very helpful for all of us. So uh, today's the last day of IWS uh, Digital Week. And now I request everyone to join back the exhibition where we have the best suppliers of the industry waiting for you. Enjoy networking and have a good business. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day and stay Thank safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Pero